Okay, let's go ahead and open a word of prayer. I'm so excited for tonight's lesson. I hope that you're excited too. We're 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 swimming. We're swimming in the water. Let's okay. Let's open a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you for your grace and for your love for us, and we thank you that you have sent your Son to Earth to die for our sins. We thank you that you promised that you would do this, and you fulfilled your promise. And we think of how many times we fail to keep our word, even with our best intentions, and yet you sent your Son at the right time when 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 the in the fullness of time father god you sent your son born of a woman under the curse to redeem us from the curse father and so i just pray now as we study your we we go deep we go we go swimming in the deep side of 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 the pool of your word i pray that that we would all not drown i pray that this the students would would make it father at the same time there is such great truths if we can go deep i pray that we would we would see the deep truths and, and also apply them practically. Uh, as tonight, we, we set forth the foundation scripturally for what uh, Gerhardus Voss has been teaching us, Father. Uh, we, we accept those things that he teaches us that are our truth, that are uh, an accurate explanation of your word, and those, those things that maybe are, are from his own opinion, um, may they fall to the ground and may we not remember them. So Father God, we ask a blessing upon this time, strengthen the students, Give, we, we ask a special uh, prayer for, for good internet for everyone, that the internet connection would stay firm. We also pray that the power would remain on and that your spirit would be with us around the Philippines. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, let's get into the, the PowerPoint for tonight. And so we are on to session number three, Introductory Issues Part 2. So we are going to finish this. We are going to finish Introductory Issues tonight. We're going to discuss chapter two. We're going to look at chapter two's notes. Um, and so we're going to do it. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and let's move on now to um, just a, a quick brief reminder of those partnerships that are making this happen. And so we're so thankful for that. Um, let's go ahead and look at a, a brief overview for tonight's uh, session and discussion. Number one, we're going to, to look. Last week, we set the foundation, the, the truths that Boss said. This week, the first step is we're going to be looking at the biblical foundation for those truths that we presented to you. So this is really the, the foundation, and also you did this for your homework. So we're going to discuss this uh, scriptural basis. And so the, passage, the passages of scripture that we will be looking at will be Matthew 5, 17 to 20, Mark 1, 14 to 15, Luke 24, and that's actually 13 to 49, but we're really going to focus on verses I believe 43, 44 until verse 49. We'll be looking at Romans 1, 1 to 5, Romans 16, 25 to 27. We'll also be looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, and uh, uh, that should be chapter 8 and chapter 12. We probably will not get to chapter 12. We will save that for when we discuss New Testament. But for sure, we'll look at uh, chapter 8, chapter 2, and chapter 1. And uh, I want to emphasize, we are not going to be unpacking everything there is to say about these verses. Uh, there are entire books written on these, these verses here, each one. So we are not going to be going into all of the different significances. We are looking only at significances as they relate to the history of Revelation and the relationship between New Testament and Old Testament, okay? New Covenant and Old Covenant, okay? After that, we will seek to do, discuss the reading from chapter 2, and then lastly, the notes from chapter 2. So this is a lot. This is a lot. We've got to move. We're a little bit behind, and so maybe sometimes I will ask to hold your question. Maybe you can write the question down, and at the end, we can discuss it, okay? So um, we're going to be working through. Now, sometimes we'll have a discussion, so we'll just see how this goes, but we do need to kind of, we have to, we, we, we can't, uh, we cannot uh, delay here. Okay. Um, relationships and scripture, things to consider, concepts to consider here. So we have the relationship of eschatology and soteriology. So looking at um, throughout these passages, we're looking at when we say eschatology, last things, how it relates to soteriology, salvation. So uh, we could say soteriology or redemption. So now if, if you can imagine, we're bringing in revelation eschatology, last things, and also soteriology and, or, 
or redemption. So there, there's an interrelationship here. We'll briefly touch on that. Again, we could have a whole class there. Uh, we'll also look really specifically at the relationship of Christ to the Old Testament. We will consider the gospel, the relationship of the gospel in the Old Testament. To consider Christ, there's also a relationship with the gospel. Also, we will be looking at the relationship of revelation and covenant. So old and new, shadow and types, greater than. So maybe I'm giving you a little bit of a hint. I'm, look, I'm giving you a little bit of a hint for some of the homework assignments there. And so the passages that we're looking at these, so I'm looking at uh, big, these are the big ideas that we're going to be looking at. And then here's the scriptural support. So you can see that uh, Mark 1, 14 to 15, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, Luke 24, 44, the Romans 1, 1 to 5, and also 16 to 25, I mean, 16, 25 to 27, Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2, and Hebrews chapter 8. Okay, so uh, looking at the, co the concepts, the concepts and scripture, the relationship between Old and New Testaments, we are going to tweak out this, this idea of what testament means, so I, I don't want to answer what the testament means precisely, um, but the fundamental relationship is that of promise and fulfillment. And so as we look through these examples, we need to be considering this relationship. So in many ways, I'm giving you the answer before we look. Uh, I, I want us to see it as we work through the text, okay? And then also there's going to be some illustrations that we will be looking at here, okay? Uh, next, in looking at the relationship between Old and New Testaments, I have a quotation here. So looking at this promise fulfillment relationship, I do have a quotation here to consider. Um, this is William Manson, and uh, I'm not familiar with him. I haven't really heard of him before. Uh, I, I, read, I read this quote in uh, G.K. Beale's book. So <laughs> for those of you who have heard of G.K. Beale, he quoted him, and I thought this quotation was very profound, and it's something we need to consider as right before we enter into the study. And this is in connection with Voss. Manson says, when we turn to the New Testament, we pass from the climate of prediction to that of fulfillment. The things which God foreshadowed by the lips of his holy prophets, he has now in part at least brought to accomplishment. Watch this. This is big. This is big. The supreme sign of the eschaton. Now, eschaton literally is the last days, the, the end of the ages. The supreme sign of the last days, of the last things, is the resurrection of Jesus and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the church. So many times we think about like, oh, it's still in the distant future. We're looking at this. And that's not to deny, he says in part, so it's not to deny there's a future, a future component. But, there, but in the resurrection of Jesus and the descent of the Holy Spirit, we are now looking at uh, the last days having begun. The resurrection of Jesus is not simply a sign which God has granted in favor of his son, but is the inauguration, the beginning, the entrance into history of the times of the end. So we're going to see that. We're going to see that explicitly in the scripture. So be looking for that. Christians, therefore, have entered through Christ into a new age. Right? Anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. The new has come. <laughs> so we're already there. Maybe we don't think about it like that, but we're already there. What had been predicted in the Holy Scripture has to happen to Israel or to man in the eschaton has happened to and in Jesus. So those things that, that had to happen to Israel or to man or at the last has happened to Jesus Christ. He is the one. The foundation of the new creation has come into position, the cornerstone, okay? So uh, that is not to say that there is not yet other parts of the eschaton to come. We are still waiting for the resurrection of our bodies. We are still waiting for the return of Christ. We are still waiting for the, 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 um, the new heavens and the new earth, okay? So it's not to say that everything has been fulfilled. It is to say that we are, it has already begun. It has already begun. Okay. All right. So scriptural foundation. So we've been waiting for it. We've been waiting for it. Uh, so here we go. Matthew 5, 17. Please turn in your homework assignment and also into your, 
in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. And so the questions I asked you is, who is the actor? What is the object? What is the action or actions? What is the relationship between, okay? And then also, um, let us now analyze the text. I'm going to quickly read this text. There's a lot of things we can talk about. I will not talk about everything, but we're looking at those specific questions. Who is the actor? What is the object? What is the action? What is the relationship? And let's analyze the text, okay? Let's go ahead and read the text. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one yoda, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's a lot to be said here. We cannot discuss all of them. Just bear with me one second. I'm bringing my, my notes for this up. Uh, the first question we want to be asking us, the first question we want to ask is, the first question is, uh, who is the actor? So go ahead and look at your notes here. And um, does someone want to answer that question for me? Who is the actor? Jesus, the one who speaks. Yes. Great. So we have here the, this I here. This is the actor. And he really, he really is maintained throughout this whole context here. So, so we have here, um, Jesus is the actor. So I hope that makes sense, right? Now, what is the object? What is the object? Okay, so okay, so hold on here. So we have the the object. Um, we're looking at object. So someone says law. What else? Is there any other objects? The prophet. Okay, the prophets. So that we could say we could say plural. We could say prophets, right? Prophets. So we see that here. So let me just highlight. We see that here, and also here, right? Now, can we get more specific, or can, not? Maybe not more specific, but clarify. What what else does this represent here? What else does this represent? Old Testament. Hmm. Old Testament. And what else? What's another word we could also use to describe? The covenant. Old covenant. Okay, yeah, no, excellent. So we could we can actually um, let's let's tease this out here. This is dealing with this idea of covenant, right? And especially old covenant. Excellent. So when Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, um, it's, also, it's, it's more than just, you know, what's signifying here is this idea of covenant, okay? And so we're going to unpack that further. Um, everyone tracking with me, everyone tracking with me, maybe you want to push back and say, Tim, you're, you're, you're reading into this too much or I disagree with you. Anyone want to, want, to, want to do a pushback here or that you would agree with that? I, I think it's fair. It should, not be, it should not be debated. It should not be controversial. Yeah, it should be, it should be pretty, yeah, it should be pretty, pretty fair. Now, we also said Old Testament and another, another word that also we, we, we can, our concept is holy writings or we could say we could say scripture, Diba. Now, the reason why we can say that definitively is because this, this here, this here is, is referred to as a merism. A merism, we discussed this in hermeneutics. <laughs> I 
It's why it's important, right? Amerism, it, uh, there's two ways you can, you can use amerism. Amerism, you can have three different uh, concepts within a larger category. When you list the three concepts, it, 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 it indicates the greater reality. It indicates the greater concept. So if I were to say, if I were to say from, from sea to shining sea in the US context, that's a reference to America, from Atlantic to Pacific, okay? Um, uh, you can also, so you could do either, either like polar opposites or a list like, like within the category. So here we have, we have opposites, right? The law is the beginning, the prophets are the end. Now, of course, um, uh, depending on, on which scripture you're looking at, but again, um, I don't want to go into all those debates on how, how you come to that, but, but you have at least two, you have two opposites, prophets and law. And so it's signifying the Old Testament, okay? Is, that, is everyone tracking there with me? Everyone's tracking with me? So in your assignment, you could have, you could have had these, you could have had these for the object, okay? You could have had this for the object. I, I want us to see that all of this is, is, is being contained, okay? Now there is an accent on the law. So if you just wanted to specify the law, because some people say the focus is just on the law because the prophets are really just interpretation of the law, okay? Um, but I do think there is, it, it's, it's more than just the law as in um, the Pentateuch, okay? It's more than that. It's, it's, we want to say at least the Old Testament scriptures, okay? We should have that in our, in our mind, okay? All right, now, what's the action? What's the action? Yeah, okay, so the action is, so let's, let's just highlight several action words. Pastor Henry got to like the, the, the really the key action, okay? So I'll just, I'll highlight several so that, because in highlighting several, we can really draw significance here. So we have, we have this. I have, uh, I have come to abolish, but it's not, it's not. And so here it's restated. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill, okay? And you have this here, okay? So these are all uh, interrelated, right? Abolish is negative. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill or until all is accomplished, okay? So looking at the big picture, the big action, if we're looking at the big picture, the action would be, the action would be come to fulfill. So what we have here, just bear with me. We have, we have here Jesus the action of fulfill and the, the, we could say scripture, we could say Old Testament, we could talk about law, and, and what, what, what we're meaning here is we're also meaning this old covenant idea. We'll, we'll talk about that specifically. We'll get there. We'll get there in due time. Okay. So then the relationship must be one of fulfillment. Okay. Everyone tracking with me? So this idea of fulfillment between the, the person and work of Jesus. So let's be, specify here. Person, person and work. And you could even talk about people, right? Jesus has a people, <laughs> right? It's this one idea of fulfillment, okay? Notice it's not abrogation. It's not abrogation. Notice it's not an aside. Many people will say, oh, the, you know, 
Jesus tried to do something. He tried to establish his kingdom and he couldn't. So that so God's plan was put on hold and they started a plan B, okay? And he's going to come back and deal with plan A again. And you don't see that at all in this context, okay? Now you have to look at other texts to, 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 to go deeper, but fundamentally Jesus's work, the person, the goal is this one idea of fulfillment, okay? It's not abrogation and it's not an aside, okay? Now, when we talk about fulfillment, what's really interesting here is that when we talk about fulfillment, we think of like accomplishing something. Jesus is going to do something, okay? But if you notice here, he gives a series of commands and a call to teach, right? So you have teaching, you have these commands, right? And it's all connected with, we could say the eschaton, The kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of the heavens, okay? And so in this fulfillment, Jesus is go both going to fulfill, but he's also going, so he's going to, he's go, Jesus is going to, he will do things to bring, to fulfill. He will also complete things. And he will also command things to be done. Okay, meaning to say that in whatever Jesus is setting up, it's not a, a cancellation of law. Okay, and you see that just after Matthew 5 20, Jesus gives interpretation of Old Testament law, Old Covenant law. Okay, <laughs> and let's take a pause. This is, this is essentially the, the big points I want to make for this. Let's ask, let's, let's ask about the, um, let's ask about the, the homework. What are your questions? What are your comments? I hope it's making sense. So the, the big point I want to see is that Jesus is in relationship to the law. Notice that. <laughs> and the law is, the law, as we discussed before, is part of this special revelation. Okay. And he's the one bringing this revelation to climax to fulfillment um and so what we really see is that uh with the coming of jesus it's the climax it's, it's coming to the climax okay and so thinking about revelation and redemption revelation and redemption um that's really critical to be thinking about that the climax is it's going to be climaxed in the sun okay let's go all right next passage of scripture Next passage of scripture is Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I don't think this was part of our assignment, but I do want to touch on this because of the connection with Christ. And um, at least in the first passage, we looked at the connection. Jesus is connected and fulfilling the law. But look at another key word, and this really kind of brings us, it brings us into the story. Um, uh, let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, okay? Again, we're just going to look at it briefly. There's a lot of detail here. There's, it's, it's very phenomenal. Um, we can't go into everything. I'm just going to highlight some things for us. Uh, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So here we have this action of proclaiming, and the object is the gospel of God. Okay, And so, of course, for us, we're interested in... <laughs> the gospel right that's our calling we're ministers of the gospel for ordained right but notice this notice this the mode or the method right there's there's we could also talk for another time but this is preaching the proclaiming the the, the greek word is a unique word for for preaching that's often used in, in paul so we could say proclaiming or preaching, preaching the gospel of God. That would be a, that would be a, a good uh, statement to use. Okay, so that's the mode. Jesus is preaching. He's preaching the gospel. Amen. We do that. We want to do that. Look at now the content. Look at the content here. This is what's the first thing. 
<laughs> God did a preaching. Fulfillment. The time is fulfilled. We talked about this before. The, the fundamental declaration of the gospel is Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So we don't start the gospel, we don't think of the gospel as just a New Testament concept. It's fundamentally an Old Testament concept that's only being brought into reality. I want to emphasize here continuity. There's discontinuity and continuity, but for our view of Revelation, look at the closeness. Look at the connection of Revelation. The gospel is a special revelation, right? Right? The gospel is special revelation, but now it's going to be connected with redemption, uh, and it's connected with the Old Testament. So the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Look at this. So this is what we, this is the call. Repent and believe. Okay? So we can easily say here that this is a reference unequivocally. People will want, people will want to talk about different gospels. People will want to talk about different gospels. And perhaps there's, we can say there's different nuances to the gospel. There's different aspects of the gospel. But we should not be talking about two different gospels. Okay? This here is dealing with salvation. Viva salvation. Or we can say redemption. Redemption. Ah. Ah. No, we got it. Look at the connection here. We have explicitly the connection of revelation and redemption. Is everyone making the connection there? Everyone's got it, okay? It's inseparable. It's inseparable. Revelation is the proclaiming and explanation of the act. Okay, <laughs> we're good. All right. Um, uh, and again, the, the presence of the kingdom of God, the presence of the kingdom of God, again, this is, is an eschatological reference. So that's why I brought up the reference that eschatology uh, there's, it's, it's proximate, it's always present with salvation. And in many times later, we can have a class on this, pa Pauline, Pauline, eschatology. Um, eschatology precedes soteriology. The last days have to come before you get the salvation. <laughs> so many times we think salvation is first, and then later we have last things. But eschatology actually precedes soteriology in that the last days have to arrive to receive the actual salvation okay so looking here the time is fulfilled eschatology it's here the kingdom of heaven is at the kingdom of god is at hand and but redemption has not the, the redeeming act has not actually transpired yet it's going to it's going to be so I just was thinking if, if um, you know, Bales and others are, you know, have these uh, positions of Amelianism. So I think this is the, <laughs> this is a, you know, a passage that really proves about the kingdom now, you know, the, the, the eschatological sense or the king eschatological yeah. aspect of, yeah. of the kingdom yeah. here and now. Yeah. So, in other words, a millionism. Well, not, so not necessarily. So, I'll I'll add a caveat there, Sonny. Now, the in, the the conclusion you're making, I would say yes, it, that's a good conclusion to make, and I think we, we should make that. But others will. You have progressive dispensationalism, which will not say that they would they would say yes, yeah. it's partly here, but they still see their other scheme. So, so Beale and Schreiner would would make your conclusion. Many would make your conclusion, but others would make it would 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 adopt this truth that I'm I'm sharing. They've adopted to, to their system. Okay, so 
systems have adapted, frameworks have adapted because of these significances, okay? Um, some have not. And so I would really say that, you know, it's not like, okay, we're done. You're all, we're all on millennial now. We, I, I don't think just looking at this, we can say that. But what we should say is that we should readjust to really see that with the coming of Christ, the last days are here. Okay, we're going to see that. <laughs> we're still, we're going to see that. If you remember the reading, we're going to see that, okay? Um, but great, great comment and observation. I shouldn't say observation, Sonny. Great conclusion. So just to be clear, Sonny is making a conclusion. He's making an inference from, from, from the, the content. And, and, and it, would be, it would be a good conclusion, okay? Um, anyone else want to make a comment or, or have a question? Team. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, when we talk about this passage um, and and what you have pointed out right now, that uh, it, it is not just simply focusing on Jesus only, but to see the timeline as far as redemptive, the redemptive plan of God and, and his coming uh, ushered in or ushered us in to uh, the eschaton. Yeah. So when, when it says here, repent and believe in the gospel, um, is it now saying that you now have uh, greater proof that the gospel promised at the very start um, would, would, be, would be made complete? Yeah. 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 So, so it's not just it's not just simply looking at uh, Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the center of it, but the complete redemption, yeah. which means uh, the consummation of of all things. Because uh, I think I think that that is re revolutionary. If uh, we we will be able to to see the the bigger picture. Yeah. So, of so what has been promised. So, so the consummation has begun, but it's not yet brought to completion. So, so this is the big, the big idea that we'll, the, that George Ladd and others actually it originates from Voss is this already, already, not yet, not yet framework. Okay, so with the coming of Christ, the time is fulfilled. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Already we are in those last days. Already the, the, the consummation is, is beginning, but it is not yet. We're, uh, it, it, there is still, um, we're caught between two, okay? They're running parallel. So that's why, that's why sometimes you hear Paul say, um, you are saved, past tense. Other times, 1 Corinthians 15, you are being saved. You are being saved, present tense. Other times, um, uh, it's still future. Uh, Romans 5, 1 to 11, there's a reference there to we will be saved from his wrath. Uh, Tim, I thought we were saved. Uh, we are saved in Christ. So, so it's this already not yet, um, because everyone thought when, when the Messiah would come, it would be over. And it was like, no, it's it's not over. He is here. It is It is being fulfilled. But there's now this, this this time period that was not really understood before but it was planned by god absolutely it was planned by god um so there was something i wanted to say in connection with what um oh so when you said there's a heightened the, the explicit reference to that ending is act 17 in former times god overlooked the ignorance of man now now <laughs> He commands everyone to repent. <laughs> so, so there was a time where God overlooked during during the anticipatory time, during the the promised time. God overlooked all the nations. He was gracious. Now, now He commands everyone to repent. So, so that would be a, a, a reference to your observation that is really excellent. Ending. It's a great observation. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Go ahead. Question. There, there seems to be, um, I would not like to use confusion, but probably a misconception, probably yeah. a misconception of the word fulfilled. Yeah. Can we just limit the application of the fulfilled? 
into the fulfillment of the promise that the Messiah will come. You're saying to limit the fulfillment just to the coming of the Messiah. Yes, right. That's right. So there will be no confusion that the when when that when the one on the screen is the time is fulfilled. Uh, can we just limit that to the time when Jesus came? That is the promise, the fulfillment of the promise of becoming Messiah. Because as you said, redemption is still being, uh, still to come in the second coming at the end of time. So uh, it would be it would be incongruous to apply the fulfillment when it's still being processed or still to come. But the coming is fulfilled because Jesus came as the Messiah. In, in that respect, can we just apply the time is fulfilled to that aspect of the revelation when Jesus actually came? The well, so, but you have more than just the coming of the Messiah, Divai. You have the, the forgiveness of sins, which was promised. So that was that was done on the cross. That, that was accomplished. You have the, the, the presence of the Spirit is also the sign that the kingdom of God is here. If I cast out the, the strong man, then the, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So I would say that you can't just limit it to the Messiah because there's a lot, there's a lot more other constructs, uh, constructs that are present. Um, but what we want to say is that all of them are present, but yet not yet fully consummated. So for example, Kuya Bullboy, justification was supposed to be the Old Testament, if there's just one final judgment in which you were justified. Either you were acquitted or you were you were condemned. That justification is in the present with Christ now, right? But there's still that final judgment that we will, that of course we being in Christ will overcome. But that final judgment, we talked about this, Diba. It's like the, ju the judge has already did, pounded the gavel, but you still have to go you still have to go to the court in the future. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why I see what you're saying. And 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 there are some uh, eschatological positions, Koya Boy Boy, that would agree with you. They would say, we just want to talk about, we want to limit it only to Jesus. But the difficulty is, is that there's so many other constructs that are part of the consummation that are already here. The giving of the spirit, the, the indwelling of God in us. That's already part. That's already spiritually, the, 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 the new creation is already in us. So there's a lot of other constructs. So we would, um, to, to maybe clarify, now, now if, if, if you're not comfortable, then, that, then that's fine. I don't, want to, I don't want to pressure you. But from my perspective, what I would say is that everything is here now, but not consummated. That, that, that's what I would want to say. It's here now, but not consummated. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, that makes sense, but still the question remains because some are still either confused, misunderstood, or hard to believe that it is fulfilled. At the same time, it's still not complete. So how do you reconcile the use of the word complete, uh, fulfilled, at the same time, it's not complete? That's why. So there must be some, some way, some way to, to, to better uh, illuminate or uh, illustrate the time is fulfilled in a certain sense, whether you call it limited or expanded or whatever, but uh, something that will make the time is fulfilled more meaningful to, to, to more people to understand. So, so maybe, I, maybe I'll say, maybe I, let me try to diagram it. Maybe let's try to diagram it. So, the, the, so, so, so here, let, let me first diagram that then we can have a comment. Okay, so the Bob, if you're looking at time, right? So we have we have we have time here, correct? Okay. Now, typically, we, we think of, you know, you have you have events in time, right? Okay. So what we typically think, Koya Bullboy, is there is one promise that's going to point to one fulfillment. Okay. That's that's even that's how the Jews had thought. That's why when Jesus came, John the Baptist was like, the whole shebang is going to be over, right? In reality, though. What, what we're saying is this, okay? Let's, let's say this is, this is inaccurate. What it's more like is like this. So the X, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a time period, not a point in time. Is that helpful, Koya Boy? 
yeah, of course, uh, we understand. But uh, how do we explain that better to those who who will not really understand even the illustration? <laughs> Anting, say something, and then maybe I'll just do a quick rejoiner to kind of clarify. Let me just say this before Anting says something. This is partially, there, there's, Sonny is presenting a perspective um, that a lot of theologians will hold to. Bull Boy is bringing up uh, issues with some perspective. So Koya Bull Boy's uh, critique or question is very legitimate. Uh, Sonny is also presenting, you know, a way to answer. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just wanting to, to, to kind of clarify here. Um, um, uh, Pastor Enzi, go ahead, and then, and then I'll bring some more comments, and then we can discuss at the end. So go ahead, Pastor, Pastor Enzi. Yeah, um, uh, this is just this is just to go back to the timeline you did, uh, team, because yeah, in in relation to what has been discussed, um, if we go back to scripture, this is just how scripture does it. In in other words, we are not the one who put meaning into this, but the Old Testament has already defined that the eschaton is a timetable yes. and 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 jesus ushered it in um so yeah no yeah so we could not uh, the scripture bound us yeah. scripture bound us to accept that it is talking about a period yeah and not just an event so it's not coming from us it's coming from the old testament that it is actually a timetable yeah no an and, aeon yeah. or an great, age great, yep. great point what pastor anting is saying is so so yeah so this description is this is what this is how scripture describes it and so we're trying to do justice to what the text says so yeah that's really that's really uh <laughs> that's that's the rub so you know quite a bull boy maybe it is hard to understand it is complicated you know that's why this is this is more deeper theology it does have it does have great significance in our life um let me give a practical. Let me give a practical um, uh, illustration to, to to bring this into the practical. Okay, um, and I I think I've given this to you before, but I'll just bring it again um, um, to to draw this into into practical reasoning. Okay, if if I promise if I promise let me, let's say I promise Kuya Bulba, I I promise you a thousand bucks. Okay, I promise you a thousand bucks, and um and then uh. Uh, three months later, I say, hey, Koya Bulba, I'm going to give you another thousand bucks. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to say, where's my first thousand, right? <laughs> you're going to say, where's the first thousand? You know, and I'm going to say, oh, I'll still give it to you. Um, maybe my, maybe my, my promise does not hold so much weight, okay? Maybe my promise is not so weighty, okay? Um, uh if I have already given you the money, then you can be assured that whatever promise is yet in the future, it's guaranteed. You're like, no problem. You gave me the thousand bucks last time. Tim, I will look forward to the thousand bucks when you're going to give it to me like the next month, right? So the, the promise fulfillment assures us of the yet, uh, the future promise, okay? Okay. Um, with the coming of the Messiah, with the coming of the kingdom, however we see the kingdom, that, that could be another class, okay? With the coming of the spirit, with the coming of the final judgment declaration, you are, you are guiltless, you are righteous now. Um, we, we should not talk about, we have to talk about fulfillment. Um, we have to talk about fulfillment of, of promise. And so that's why Jesus says, uh, we're using this fulfillment language, okay? Um, uh, that's not to say, though, that, the, that, that other aspects of the promise are yet future. So, for example, um, the promise that God will dwell with us is now in us. <laughs> that's fulfilled, the, right? The promise that we will be a part of the new creation is now in our new birth, okay? So we do want to stress 
there is fulfillment now, and it has to be much more than simply Jesus coming um, to earth. Okay. So I'm, I'm just, I'm getting a little animated. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not preaching. I'm just, I'm excited. Okay. I, get, I like to get excited. Okay. So I want, I want to really bring this into view here that this is incredibly significant with the coming of Jesus, but it has to be more than simply Jesus came. Um, it has to be more than simply um, uh, Jesus did some things and then he went up to heaven. Okay. So I, I want, I want, um, there is a heightened level, and, and, I, and I do think that this is revolutionary for many of us. For me, it was revolutionary, um, but I'm going to hold it there because let's go look at these other passages of Scripture, and, um, and then we can have the discussion again. So, so for sure, you're going to have a question. Kay had asked a question. I, I'm sorry, Kay, for cutting you off. I didn't mean to cut you off. It's just I'm trying to guard our time so that we can, we can get through everything. So let's go ahead. It's 7.05. Um, I'm going to do one more passage of Scripture. Because we started late, then we'll take a ten-minute break. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's turn in our let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Luke twenty-four. Let's go in our Bibles to Luke twenty-four. Okay, Luke twenty-four. Now we're going to look at this passage, and again, a lot we could talk about. We're, we don't actually have time to look at earlier in Luke. We're, that that's that's dealing with interpret interpretation, looking at the Old Testament. Again, we're looking at this fulfillment. We're looking at this fulfillment language, okay? Emphasizing this promise fulfillment pattern, all right? Um, so I'm going to read it here, then I'm going to come back and highlight. Luke 24, 44 to 49. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, okay? Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things, and behold, I am sending the promise. <laughs> I am sending the promise of, of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So, um, Wow. <laughs> Thinking about our discussion here, there seems to be more. There seems to be a lot more promise fulfillment um, than you know uh, than simply Jesus coming or 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 even or even doing one or two things here. But let's come back here and let's highlight. We have this statement here that this object, everything, and then what with reference to what written about me so it's everything that was written about me and then what's what is it what is it it's in the law of moses the prophets and psalms how did you define this what was your answer someone want to give me an answer old testament old testament, old testament. excellent excellent and it should be old testament it should be more then just oh because the, it's not all the writings. What about what about Job? <laughs> what about what about Ecclesiastes? Right. So this is an example of a merism. This is another example of a merism. So um, that's why hermeneutics is important. So this is this is three examples that's pointing to the greater reality, which is the Old Testament. Okay. All right. And the statement in here is that it must be fulfilled. Okay. Coming down here, what is the content? Okay, what is the content here? So uh, we have this, again, fulfillment language. And then the content is the Christ should suffer and should rise from the dead. So here, this is the crucifixion. And this is the resurrection. All right. Then you have, but it's more, it's more, it's more, it's more than just pertaining to Jesus and even his work, right? It's more than, it's more than the Messiah and his work, right? Look down here. Uh, repentance and forgiveness should be 
proclaimed. This is the Great Commission, right? This is the Great Commission, right? This is the, this is the Great Commission here. Everyone's tracking with me, right? So we would say yes. We would say, we would say yes. Resurrection fulfillment, great, uh, crucifixion. Now, maybe, maybe someone would say, well, where is that in the Old Testament? Crucif crucifixion, yes. Resurrection, ah, wow, that's fulfillment. Repentance, fulfillment. <laughs> Forgiveness of sins, fulfillment. Great commission. It's part of the fulfillment. And this is all connected. Look, this is all connected. Look at this. It's all connected with me, right? Because look at the connection here. I, I hope everyone can see that. Thus it is written. So you cannot separate the Messiah from repentance and forgiveness being proclaimed. That's why sometimes Paul will say, Paul will say the proclaiming of the gospel. And then sometimes he will say the, the proclaiming of Christ. <laughs> it's all connected. It's all, it's all connected, okay? Um, and then look here. You are witnesses to these things. And this term witnesses is actually, this is a pregnant term uh, looking, looking at Isaiah 40 to 53. You will be my witnesses. <laughs> Right? Jehovah's Witnesses say that's them, <laughs> but we know better, okay? Um, but then there's one more. There's one more promise, and the other promise here is this. This promise that's going to clothe you with power, right? And we would all say that this is the Holy Spirit. But again... This is all part of this fulfillment. Now you would say, oh, the, the promise is separate from the content of this is written, but it's the promise from God. <laughs> so, and this is contained in the prophets. This is contained in the prophets. So what I want us to see here is you know, there is an eschatology, and this is not an eschatology, because that's why I don't want to get into that debate, okay? That would be for another time. We could have it, okay? This should be, these, these, these uh, truths should not be debated. The point here is that the, the promise and fulfillment is more than the Messiah. It's more than just his presence. It's more than just his work. Uh, there is a position that will say the crucifixion was, un, you know, it, it happened. It wasn't, it wasn't plan A. But, but what, what Jesus is saying here is that it is, it's, it's, it's part of the promise. It's part of the, it's part, it's part of the fulfillment, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the, the repentance, the great commission, the promised Holy Spirit. This is part of what the last days are like. This, is, this should be revolutionary. Everything is, in the words of Graham's Goldberg, everything's going according to plan. Maybe this. It's, let's take a break. We can talk. We can discuss your questions on the break. We can continue this discussion on the break. But I do want to take a break. I also want to encourage everyone, um, you know, don't be stressed because these are, you know, these debates, these discussions are going on for many years. People change, you know, so I, I, I don't want anyone to come away from this discussion being stressed. What I hope we can come away from this discussion is, wow, I have a whole new area of study that just, it's just, it's like, it's like a whole new other place that we can study together. So that, my hope is for us just to be excited that we have all this new real estate that we can explore. That, that's kind of my, my encouragement. Yeah. And don't worry, your assignments, I'm not looking for this, like, don't worry about your assignments if you didn't have these things, okay? I'm, um, the, the questions were basic, and if, you, and if you just had that basic actor, the basic object action, then, then, then you'll be fine, okay? So don't, don't be stressed if you feel like, oh, man, I don't, I don't have this full... 
this is why we have lecture. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Yeah, it's true, sir, sir Tim, because uh, this one is a new level for me. It's a different level of, you know, of thinking. Yeah. It's really different. Yeah. Well, for me, I'm telling you, for me, it was it was revolutionary. So if anyone, it's it should be revolutionary for all of us. Now, the actor is not actually Jesus, correct? Really, the actor in this, we could say, is God himself or the scripture, because it's the scripture that that pro that promised and then it was fulfilled okay so really at the end of the the ultimate actor in this context is really god himself he, he's the one that made the promise now um uh he's the one that brought to fulfillment you could see jesus as an actor as well but i wanted to really see that god was the one because it's the scripture that's making the promise okay so the, the, if you had jesus uh or if you had if you had God, um, that's really that's really the one who is the the, the the actors here. Okay, the object of course is the Word of God, the Scripture, and then that action is this idea of fulfillment. Okay, and I included not only the action but also the content of what was being fulfilled. And so there is multiple things uh, that are signifying that are being fulfilled. And, and we talked about the Holy Spirit. The, the, the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness, the, the Great Commission. Uh, we also discussed the crucifixion and resurrection. Those are, all, those are all things that were promised and now have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled. Okay. All right, let's go on now to Romans. Turn in your Bibles to Romans. And again, we're looking at who is the actor, what is the object, what is the action, and what is that relationship. So we're going to right now analyze the text. Again, we'll try to move quickly. So let's go to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Let me go ahead and read Paul, uh, Romans 1. Romans 1, 1 to, 1 to 5, 1 to 6, okay? Romans 1, 1 to 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Con concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So, again, we're looking at this fulfillment language. And this promise fulfillment, okay, so maybe there isn't a fulfillment, but, but uh, explicitly, but possibly implicitly, okay? Um, just highlighting some things here, we notice that Paul has been uh, set apart, and what he's been set apart for is the, the gospel of God, okay? Um, and so we, we agree with that. That's like, okay, that's good. Um, but look at where the, or, the, where the gospel originated from. Which, which he uh, promised. Go ahead. It's in the Old Testament. Yes. Okay. So here we go. He is God and the promise the promise. God promised beforehand through what? What are the means by which he promised? Prophet. The prophets in the scriptures. Holy scriptures. Okay. So what we have here is we have a reference to, we have the actor who is God. So God is the actor. Right? The object. I'll change color so we're consistent. The object is the gospel. The action is. is promise promised 
right? So this is also this is also the relationship, right? This is also the this is also the relationship here. So the gospel is promised where? It's promised in the source is the Old Testament, especially in the in the prophets. Coming down here, again, we have this. Look at this. Look at this. This is, this here is, this is Old Testament. This is Old Testament um, language, right, and, and source. And this is, this here is um, eschatological. This is a fulfillment. Fulfillment, we can also say, um, eschatological. And, this, and it's because of, we can talk about spirit of holiness and especially resurrection. Spirit of holiness, resurrection, and look at this. We don't have time to get into this, but also here. The coming of God. Okay? These are massive fulfillment language. Okay? This is massive. This is not small. This is really big. Okay? And then, and then we have, we have the reference to, again, this is Great Commission language. So again, we have this idea of promise fulfillment, okay? In some ways, this is somewhat review, but, but, in other ways, I want us to be thinking about this type of language. I want us to be thinking about these type, these type of. So we think resurrection. That is a that is a incredible. This here is a reference also to uh, new creation. New creation. Okay, okay. Um, let Let's go now because in. So this is the gospel, right? This is the gospel. This is the book for us. This is the book for the church, right? So what I want us to see here is there's actually a book end. So the way Paul begins is with the promised gospel. Look at how he ends it. Okay, so we have the beginning, Romans 1, 1 to 5, 1 to 6, and we have now the ending. Let's go to the ending, Romans 16, 25 to 27. Now, for those of you who had the Bible's big story, this is somewhat review, but again, this is fundamental to our framework. This is fundamental to, to our framework, okay? Um, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ, according to the revelation <laughs> of the mystery, the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to the nations according to the eternal command, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of, of faith, <laughs> obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Now the way Paul says this, like he's thinking like fulfillment, right? He's not like, man, there's all this stuff. You know, I'm still waiting for the payday. I'm still waiting for the payday, right? He's like, oh, where's my money, Tim? Where's my thousand dollars? Where's my money, Tim? It's like, Paul is going crazy. Like, this is happening. This is here, right? This is, this is for real. This is for real, for real. So look at this. Now, I don't want to go into, into Greek um, discussion or language. I do want to make a caveat. 
This word and can also be, uh, uh, this is a chi here, for those of you who have Greek, and this can also be translated uh, even, meaning to say that this is a clarification. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, even, or namely the preaching of Christ, meaning to say these two are the same, okay? I, I think that's the best translation because he has been emphasizing Christ throughout the whole gospel. It's not two different things. It's one and the same. To, sometimes Paul will just say preaching of Christ. Other times he'll say my gospel. Other times he'll say the gospel, okay? So um, what I want us to see here is that this is the same. It's very important, okay? Look at this. Look at this. This is, th now this is, watch this now. Romans 1, 1 to 5, you had revelation and you had redemption, right? The redemptive act, the, the redemptive act is the resurrection of Jesus. Viva. So you had revelation and redemption in, in Romans 1. Here we have, according to the revelation of the mystery, the revelation of the mystery that was that was kept secret. Okay, <laughs> so it was there. It's not new. It's not a second plan. It's not a different plan. It it was just it was just hidden, right? I have Kuyo Boboy's money, right? I just haven't revealed it to him yet, right? It's still it's in my pocket though, right? It's there. You know, when I make the promise, it's there. Okay, so this is not this is when we this is to this is to reveal. a secret. It was not clear. It now has been, so this word here, it's a little misleading. This is another word for reveal. This is also reveal. It has been revealed. It has been revealed. Through what? <laughs> through Paul's teachings? Uh, through The prophetic writings. That's Old Testament. So again, what I want to say, again, in each of these examples here, there is this two structure of revelation, redemption. It's two structure. Now, of course, we're going to tweak out a more nuances as God reveals, right? So there's also this truth that it's being revealed progressively. But looking at the big picture, like NT reminded us, it's this two structure. Promise, fulfillment, mystery, revealing. Revealed through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. Again, gospel great commission. We are a part of it. We are a part of it. The prophetic writings are for us to reveal to the nations. Again, great. So this is again great commission. This is, this is. I want us to see this. This is practical. This is deep, but this is practical. And the goal of the great commission is is not just to save people in the sense of oh they're not going to hell, they're not going to hell. Oh great, la di da. Are they are they have they become obedient to the faith? Have they submitted themselves to the will of God? Look at the goal. Goal. The obedience of faith. Faith obedience. Redemption is not just simply to save people from hell. It's not simply just so that we can be in the presence of God. Those are incredible truths. The purpose, this is a purpose statement here. Purpose. Face obedience, <laughs> practical. 
disclosing the gospel through the prophetic writings to all the nations. The practical is so that they will, they will obey God through their faith. <laughs> because the, the, there is a kind of faith that produces obedience. And watch how it ends. How it ends. How it ends is in a doxology. Doxology. <laughs> to the only wise, what is Paul's response? To the only wise God, be glory forever through Christ Jesus. Amen. That's blasphemy unless Jesus Christ is God himself. That is blasphemy unless Jesus Christ is God himself. Be glory. Be glory is the, is the benediction here. So we got the, the prayer. He, he who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, in agreement with my gospel. He can strengthen us in agreement with, it, with, with my gospel, namely the preaching of Christ. So the strength, the strength, <laughs> the strength is in the gospel, in accordance with the gospel. You see this here? It's an agreement. The one who is able to strengthen in accordance with the, the promise of the gospel is not just for our salvation. It's for it's for our strengthening, the one who is able to strengthen in accordance with my gospel and the preaching of Christ, in accordance with, in agreement with the revelation that was kept secret. Now it's been disclosed. This is what we're preaching. To this is what we're sharing to people. Revelation. And the end is doxology. What is he, What can he say? <laughs> is there to say god is the all-wise god the all-wise eternal god forevermore okay so i hope we're seeing this framework but but focus i want to focus framework framework secret revelation i mean secret revealing and this is within revelation okay gospel is 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 there okay um any questions before we go on now any questions or comments Okay, we're, we're, we're trekking. We're trekking along. We're going on. Let's go on now to, uh, let's go on now to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So we're going to look in tandem. We're looking at in tandem Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So we're looking at these, maybe it's 1 to 3. I might have, I might, I might have done a typo there. Uh, but we're looking at these two passages side by side okay we're looking at these at these two passages side by side long ago at many times and in many ways god spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these in this eschaton <laughs> these last days he has spoken to us by a son by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making a purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become, <laughs> having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So, you know, maybe this answers some of the questions we had last week. Um, <laughs> the sun or the angel? <laughs> I don't know. Let's read the other part to continue, and then we're going to come back to discuss. Therefore, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. For since the message declared by angels proved reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So it's like, wow, angels, the sun, revelation, redemption. We got redemption right here. Come on. It was first declared by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So I really hope we see, you know, uh, we talked about 
you know, Voss didn't talk a lot about content. I hope you see all of these things that we've been talking about just coming to climax in this passage. And actually, a lot of the truths that were, a lot of what I'm going to share here is actually in Voss. There's other books done by Voss, also in biblical theology. So Voss was just summarizing the truths that, that he will explain both in this book and in other books. Um, uh, so let's go back to Hebrews chapter one. Let's highlight some things. And I really hope we can see the structure, the framework of revelation and redemption. I think it's all coming into, it's all coming together here. And um, let's look here. So at least here we can say we have this act. We have this act here, right? This action. And the action that we have is God speaking, right? God is the actor. And the act is God spoke. So there's a time reference here. There's a time reference. Long ago, so this is a time reference. Here's another time reference. And here's a, a, a manner, or we could say means. A means reference, okay? So God spoke to who? He spoke to our fathers. The object here is the fathers, correct? And the, and, and, um, we probably want to focus on, we probably want to focus here on manner because the means is going to be here, right? I, actually, let, let me, I, that's a typo here. I should say this will probably be um, agency here, agency. Some people will want to say means. Second, many times, Tim, can, can it also be the, the frequency of occurrence many times? Frequency yeah. of occurrence. Can it also be frequency of occurrence, although it involved time? Yes, no, frequency and, yes, so we also want it for sure because of the many. The many is connected here. So, no, that's good. Thank you. Boy, boy, that's an excellent observation. I had not thought about that before. But, no, we do want to talk about frequency, and we want to talk about uh, um, uh, uh, the actual time itself, okay? So that's good. Yeah. Now, look. Look at this, act, act. So there is a relationship here. But in these, again, time reference, last days. If ever, if ever, we are in eschatos, eschatos. Last, and this is actually, so Sonny had referenced Lad, Lad's good. You know, someone who really emphasized this is Beal. So Lad is good. You know, I'm not taking away from Sonny's recommendation at all. I, I've also read Lad, but someone who is probably a little bit better than, than, than Lad, um, because again, he has more, he has more, um, I think he has more detailed writing, but would be GK Beal. So we can also make a recommendation for, for a book for, for um, but I don't want anyone reading any books. <laughs> no one's reading any other books. <laughs> no, <laughs> in May, you can read these books, okay? If I find out that you purchased the book and you're reading, I'm gonna come to your house, even if you're in Manila, I'm gonna come looking for you, <laughs> joke. <laughs> but we should be reading <laughs> Voss right now. Voss is the foundation, okay? No one's reading any other book, okay? Um, but, but look here, uh, he has spoken, he has spoken, he, again, is God. He has spoken to us. Object. <clears throat> Through his son. Notice here that this is also past tense. This is past tense, but also this. Now, 
make the connection here with the superiority of the sun. So notice here, if you can imagine, there is, there is prophets, angels, the sun for revelation, for revelation. So this is why, I, I think everyone can see clearly what's going on here. This is why anyone who's preoccupied with angels, I, I think there's a problem there. And, and maybe all of us have fallen into this trap before. So, but I want us to see here, the supremacy of the sun, God speaking climactically and, fi and, and in, and in uh, finality through the sun is brought his revelation to a climax. And to go back to other forms of communication in some ways is, is uh, uh, offensive, okay? So it's not to say, we're gonna discuss in a minute that you know there was still prophecies, there was going on after the sun came and spoke. So we do have to look at the purpose of, of the sign gifts. Um, but what I want to say is that anyone who is preoccupied um, upon any other form of revelation than what has now been revealed to us in Christ, uh, there's a problem there, okay? Our focus, our focus and preoccupation forevermore must be on the Son as God's final word. God's final word. Some of the commentators will say here, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, God's final word. God has spoken. Now, someone would have asked about God's sovereignty and, and, and various things like that. I want to go, I want to go back to Pastor Enting's comment. This is what the word of God says. So, so God is completely sovereign. He could have done a different method. He could have still had his son here speaking to us. But at the end of the day, this is what God has done. And we cannot question it. Okay. Um, Let's look now, connecting this, so this is primarily Revelation, let's connect this with chapter 2, okay? Um, let me just come back here really quick, okay? Also notice here, there is just this, uh, there is just this two-part structure. Does everyone see that? We could say, we could say, Old, under the old covenant and under the new covenant. Okay? And, and, and uh, the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, is debated and, you know, probably I'm in the minority, but Paul's going to prove that. Paul's going to prove that, that, that there is actually this, the whole book of Hebrews, it's in this structure, the old versus the new covenant, Okay? So this is the this is the this is the structure you see it introduced at the beginning. Okay, we're going to see this pattern again in chapter two. So chapter two, uh, the message, <laughs> the message is the object. The message was mediated. So there is what this is the this is the agent. Declared is the act. So in this one sense, the message declared by angels proved reliable, and this led to punishment. So this is one level. This is one level. How shall we? How shall we escape? So look at the parallel. Again, two-part structure. If the message sent by angels was reliable and everyone received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect the message? <laughs> no! If we neglect the salvation. 
Revelation and redemption are interchangeable. Of, of course, there's a distinction, but they're inseparable is what I'm trying to get at. It's not how shall we escape the message. That's part of it. But it's how shall we escape. It's almost like uh, salvation and the message. This is interchangeable because these are inseparable. Redemption is always with revelation. And the proof is in the pudding, right? How shall we escape so great a salvation? It was declared. <laughs> it was declared. Again, past tense action. Revelation by the Lord. And this, of course, is Jesus. Declared by the, by the Lord attested to us so this is the confirmed by those who heard so these are the these are the apostles these are the apostles and then god bore witness so god is still involved god bore witness again past tense bore witness, and the means by which God bore was signs, wonders, various miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed. Now, so you have this. The, the message, uh, so, so the order is like this, okay? You have the Lord, which is Jesus, declared. Look at the comparison with one. Then the apostles um, relayed. And then God confirmed. So look at this. Fundamentally, the miracles, the miracles, the signs, the tongues, the prophecies, this was God's work to confirm the message. <laughs> it's not a new word. It's not a new word. God is using these signs, these miracles, these gifts to confirm what was declared. I have a new revelation. <laughs> Is God really doing that? You know, I, I don't mean to attack. I don't mean, I just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to make us think. I'm trying to make us to, to conceptualize what's occurring here. We can talk about, we have the spirit in us and God still, still speaks to us through his spirit. Okay. But that's more in a figurative sense. And that's through the word of God so that we can have a class. We can have a class on the gifts of the spirit. I took a PhD level class on the gifts of the spirit. Okay. So, so we can do something like that. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot we can tease out here. I don't want to go into all, I, I don't want to go into all those different weeds. What I want us to see here though, is that revelation has been brought to a climax in Christ. God has spoken in Christ. Christ went in to the heavenly places and is and is enthroned in the heavenly places the apostles confirmed it they relayed it and then god sent out the, the those special signs in pentecost and post pentecost um but it was to confirm the message the message has been confirmed even here it it, it seems it seems to be it seems to be in the past the focus is on the declared message. The focus is upon the focus is upon what's been done, what's been fulfilled. <laughs> you see this? You see, it's like what we're wrestling with now is is clinging to that message. It's proclaiming that message. Okay, um, it's strong telegraph. You know. Whatever else, 
you know, for sure there, there, the Spirit is still giving gifts today, okay? We can discuss that, okay? Even in a, a cessationist view, there is not this strong cessation where everything, there's no more supernatural. So we need to tease that out. But I want everyone to see here, I want everyone to see here, people talking about a sign from God, like God spoke. Like here, here God literally spoke. God literally spoke in Christ, right? So, so Christ is God and he declared the word. So Christ literally spoke. When someone says that God spoke to them, is it literal? Did they actually hear, did they actually hear, hear a voice? And what was the message? Okay, so we can, we can work through those things, but to miss this, this is what the text says, it's hard. It's very hard. You know, I want us to think about this. I want us to think about this. Um, this is powerful. This is a very powerful and strong um, argument. Okay. Let's take a break and we'll come back and finish Hebrews chapter eight. We'll, 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 we'll do some summaries here. I, I think that everyone's getting the picture here. There's much more we can talk about. But what I want us to think about here is you know, I don't want I don't want us to be defending our own positions. Okay, the immediate response when when something new is brought, it's like you know you get in this defensive mode, like ah oh, no, he's coming at me, he's coming at me. It's like no. I, what I want us to think about is like this is this is groundbreaking to think that God has spoken climactically in His Son is revolutionary. Just thinking philosophically. That is incredible exaltation of his word. Diba? Why would we, just philosophically, why would we try to go looking for another word when God has self-disclosed himself in his son and the son's apostles have confirmed that message? So let's take a break. Let's think about this. You know, maybe maybe I'm, I'm pushing everyone a little bit. You know, um, you know, that's part of the learning experience. Maybe you can still, you know, there's still people that 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 re, refit their theology around. So, you know, I'm just I want you to be thinking, okay? I want us to be have an open mind and, and think. And and regardless how you come out of this, what I want us to see here though is several things. Number one, revelation is insepar is is, is uh, inseparable from redemption, okay? The two are inseparable, number one. Number two, it's climaxed, it's climaxed in Christ. Number three, there is like a two-structure pattern of the big picture. Old Testament promise, New Testament fulfilled. Okay? That's the big, those are the big, for our purposes with biblical theology, those are the big, that's the big picture. Now, Practically speaking, we have it. We we can have a discussion on tongues, on gifts of the spirit. We can have practical, tangential discussions. Okay, but those are the big. That's the big pattern that I want us to just to cling to, to 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 look at that framework. Let's go ahead and let's take a break. Okay, we're gonna have to stop it on that. We're gonna have we we have to get back. We have to finish. So actually, we will not do the reading tonight. We will finish this Hebrews chapter eight. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to do the notes for chapter two's reading. And then at the end of class, what we will do is we will pray. And anyone who wants to discuss the questions from chapter two, we can discuss. And then we will, we will pick up chapter three next week. Okay. So we're going to make an adjustment with everything, with the assignments, but, um, yeah, let's finish. I really want to finish tonight. And, um, uh, Jesus's question is a great question, and we, we want to talk through that. So, um, yeah, so let's let's just hold the questions though for chapter three till next week. Um, but 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 yeah, so uh, let's let's get into Hebrews chapter eight. So I'm going to read Hebrews chapter eight, one to thirteen, and then we're going to have a brief discussion, and uh, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. I have faith. Now, the point of what we are saying is this: we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. Thus it is necessary for the priests 
uh, also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown on to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would not have been an occasion for a second. He finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that when I took them from the, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one of his, of his, each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know the Lord from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first obsolete. And that what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, oh, very strong, very strong here. So let's just make some, some highlight. I'm just going to highlight. I'm going to move quickly here. So what I want us to first see here is that, um, <clears throat> what I first want to see here is that the topic that we have concerns the high priest, okay? So he's talking about the high priest. And specifically, the high priest, um, uh, there's one that's seated in the heavenly places, right? So, th so the high priest is Jesus. He's in the holy places, um, in the true tent of God that the Lord set up, not man. Okay, so this is, this is the one topic, right? But then there's, go, there's a comparison here. Does everyone see that here? There's a comparison with uh, every high priest. So I'm going to change the color here. So we're, we're use the color of gray, okay? Because it's a shadow. It's a shadow, okay? So we have, we, have, we have a second, right? A second category. So this here is every high priest is appointed to, to offer gifts and sacrifices now look at this here this is describing jesus now if he were on earth he would not be a priest at all why is that the case why is it the case that if he was on earth he would not be a priest at all did anyone think about that because he would be offering it all over and over again Okay, that is true. Why can't he offer it over and over again, Koya Boboy? Because he is, he is not man, he is God. He is only one. His, his offer is one and for all. Once and for all. Exactly. So the reason is, is this. I'm drawing out the parallel. Jesus is not a high priest in the Mosaic law, in the, in the Levitical priesthood. If he's on earth, he's going to be no priest at all because... His priestly duties take place in heaven. <laughs> you see that? You see that there's, there's two offices. There's two offices and they're being contrasted. Is everyone picking up on that here? Okay. So there's this, uh, we're talking about priests. We're talking about this priest, this priesthood. And there is one in the law and one in heaven. Old covenant, new covenant. Okay, so then the question, the specific topic is the priesthood, but this is entering into discussions about the covenant. 
Does everyone see that? Everyone tracking with me? Now look at this here. They serve as shadows and copies. Oops. This is another way we need to look at the framework of old and new covenants, okay? The old, the relationship is it's a copy, it's a shadow of heavenly things. It's a pattern. A pattern is not the real thing. So if you can imagine here, I'm going to draw a picture. If you can imagine here, what you have is you have, uh, you have, if you can imagine, just imagine this is in heaven. And then you have, you have the shadow is being cast down in the old covenant. It's a shadow. Okay. But if you, if you think, so a shadow reflects, a, a shadow, so if you can imagine here, if you have the sun, and then the sun has the light, and you have a real object, there is like a, a shadow that's, that's cast. This is the shadow. This is the object. This is the sun, or we could say light. So that's the image that's going on. Okay, everyone tracking with me? So when you're looking back, when you're looking back, it's a shadow. But from the perspective of the, of the old covenant, it's a type. It's pointing to. This is on earth. This is in heaven. But we're dealing with revelation because of the, the old covenant and the new covenant. It's given by God. So we can say here that this is, a, this is the big picture again, but it's, it's a slightly different picture. Is everyone tracking? So the first is promise and fulfillment. We can also think about shadow type pattern reality. Beam. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, regarding the question earlier that, that yeah, regarding this one, that um, verse four, was it verse four that if he were on the earth, he would not be a priest at all, because um, if if Christ is like the Old Testament priest, he would have to bring um, what the Old Testament law prescribes. So Christ has to offer a literal lamb, yes. but he but he's not from he's not a Levitical priest, and he's not from the shadow, but the true copy. So Jesus did not bring the sacrifices that uh, this is what he pointed here in verse three and four. <laughs> no, that's, that's a practical. That's exactly right. Because he, he sprinkles his blood on the eternal altar. He sprinkles his blood on the eternal altar. Excellent, excellent, excellent working out this. E excellent job, Enti. Um, everyone's tracking now. Everyone's, everyone's with me, okay? So the topic is the priesthood, okay? Um, so what I want us to see here, maybe someone can say, Tim, why, why you, know, um, you know, what's going on here, okay? What I want us to say is that sometimes passages, passages of Scripture, in the foreground, they're teaching a theological truth. Sometimes the theological truth is in the background, or it's a a reality that must be true in order for what the text is teaching to be true, okay? So here, the, the foreground is the author is teaching on the high priestly function, okay? But in the background is this structure. 
Is everyone tracking with me what I'm saying? So in the foreground, the primary topic is the priesthood. It's practical. The background is this structure, this, this shadow, this shadow pattern that's pointing to a greater reality. Okay. So if you're looking at the, the, the bigger topic is covenant. And then the relationship we could say is a, is a shadow reality, shadow substance type reality, something like that. Um, and and the, the reality is, look at this, look at this. It's more excellent. It's better. So this new covenant reality is better than the old covenant, okay? So that framework is going to help us in eschatological questions. Is the old system coming back? <laughs> not for this class, not for this class, okay? But think about that. Um, uh, what are we a part of? It's on better promises. Are we part of these better promises? Are we, are we, um, and so this is where the rub comes in. This is where the rub comes in, okay? And so, um, but again, this is not a eschatology class. This is not a, a frameworks class discussing dispensationalism, new covenants, covenants. For us, the primary purpose is number one. There, the pattern of revelation is, is uh, old covenant, new covenant, and that relationship is, 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 in, pat, is in types, in shadows. Um, number two, um, the new covenant is better. <laughs> and it's, it's brought to climax. It's mediated by Christ. So quite, uh, this is also revelation and revelation and redemption, right? So he's mediating the covenant. There, there is a revelation and revelation and uh, redemption um, are, are present, especially with Enting's reference to the, the, the sacrifice that's made. He, he made the sacrifice. If you study Hebrews, he made the sacrifice, okay? Um, and, and coming here, uh, the one is, the, this one is obsolete. This one is, is permanent. The obsolete one is growing old and ready to vanish, okay? Any questions or comments from the homework? I hope that makes sense. I hope that you see the big framework, the big picture. Is, is everyone tracking with me? Any questions or comments? That's why Paul said also, Sir Tim, in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, that all these are the shadows, but the substance belongs to Christ. Yeah, that's, 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 that is... Yeah, so that's so that would be actually a proof as well as to why I would I would also say that Paul is the author here of Hebrews because he's also it's a it's 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 a it's a um it's that the shadow versus substance yeah it's it's that big pattern we could use that as the big pattern too excellent reference what's the reference Sunny? Uh, Colossians chapter two verse seventeen yes Colossians is really good for this too Colossians Colossians two what's the verse. 17. 17. So we could even, we, if we had time, we could have gone to Colossians 2.17, but this, this shadow verse substance, okay, structure, okay? Everyone tracking with me? Any other questions? So basically, the shadows, the shadows are, are now obsolete because the substance is already there, the, the new covenant, the, the crime. Yeah, excellent. Yes, you're correct. Excellent conclusion. Good conclusion, Sonny. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add? Any other questions? Was this making sense from the homework? Anyone else? Sir sure, Tim, uh, yeah, good evening. Cyrus here. Cyrus. I just would like to ask uh, if the Old Testament covenant, for example, uh, the first one, it says here, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. I just would like to ask if the first one was made obsolete. Uh, so the people in the Old Testament were not uh, saved or just partially saved and they yeah. had to wait for Jesus in the, in the New Testament or 
the former was valid or, or the Old Testament co uh, covenant is still valid, but it was just made perfect in Christ. Um, I don't know if this question makes sense, but uh, I just would like to ask um, if I could rephrase that. Um, I just would like to ask if the obsolete one in the Old Testament is still valid or they have to wait for the uh, for the new covenant with Jesus in the New Testament. No, great question. So actually what the argument of the author of Hebrews is going to say is that in actuality, uh, uh, Abel by faith, <laughs> Abraham by faith, <laughs> uh, Enoch by faith, okay, uh, 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 Moses by faith. And so the faith is in, is in the new covenant. The faith is in the promise that they had not yet received. And so um, chapter two, this is why in chapter two, we're going to look in the, in, in the PowerPoint that, that now this is debated and people have different views on this, but, but I'll give, I'll share my view. It's the same view as, as Voss. And I think it makes sense is that the covenant of grace is the covenant is, is the, is the, um, is the overarching uh, covenant that, that, that was administered in two different ways. The old covenant anticipatory, the new covenant reality or fulfilled, okay? And so all of those in the old covenant, and, and Boston will make this argument, they were anticipating, they were looking for the sacrifice, they were trusting in the Messiah. And so this is why we'll see also see that, that Paul will say that the, the gospel was, the gospel was preached to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, that in fact, the Abrahamic covenant is part of the covenant of grace. It's part of this redemption in Christ. And so, um, yeah, so a, a bad reading would say that they were saved in some other way, or, you know, um, the worst would be that some people say they're saved by works, right? They're saved by works by keeping the, the, the old covenant. Um, um, and then maybe they would say that they were saved by, yeah, it's, it's a completely different, this is why the structure is so important. Um, uh, but let's just hold off until we get to Voss's section in, in chapter two, because I'm going to, I'm going to highlight the reference to um, post fall first statement of, of redemption, or I should say revelation. Um, and then, and then also that structure. I think Pastor Enting, did you want to add something? You, you turned your video on. Did you want to add something or no? I, I saw that video. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, the short answer, Cyrus, is that we would say there's there's two administrations of the same promise. The first is old covenant anticipating the new covenant. Um, but in Hebrews, everyone is sanctified once for all through the blood of the new covenant. So this, this is why, yeah, in some ways, covenant theology, you know, I, I hold the, I, it makes, it actually fixes a lot of these problems. Yeah. Uh, do you want to follow up Cyrus or is that making sense? Uh, thank you, sir. Tim. Yeah, it really makes sense. But this one, I must admit, this is really like, uh, this is mind bl uh, blowing for me, but uh, you know, um, it's really interesting. And just to follow up, Sir Tim, so the shadow, uh, the analogy of the shadow, like uh, if the shadow is cast from the original object. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, which is more potent? Like, which is more potent, the shadow or the or original object from the past? Oh, obviously it's the object. It. Okay. I yeah, the, the object is the reality, okay? And so what mm. So what the author of Hebrews is arguing, because we, this, is, this is not a Hebrews class. I would love to teach Hebrews. The whole point is that you have Christians that are, are in Christ. They say they're in Christ, and they want to go back to the shadow. And, and the author of Hebrews is like, what are you talking about? That's pointing to Christ. Why would you go back to the shadow? Why are you going back to yeah. the <laughs> Why are you going back to the model car that was promised? You know, you have... You have the Porsche, and you want to go back to the model car that you've been that, that promised you for the Porsche. So, so, you know, the, 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 that in one sense the old covenant is deficient because it can never save. The shadow is not the reality, but it points to the reality. Okay, so in one sense, the if I saw 
If I looked down on my street, I couldn't see my vehicle, but the sun was casting the shadow of my vehicle uh, on, on the concrete, I would not say my vehicle's not there. If all I could see was the shadow, I'd say, oh, it's pointing to this, it's pointing to the vehicle. The vehicle's there, right? So in the same way, it's not that the this is why the covenant is eternal, the blood of the eternal covenant, Hebrews 13, right? The covenant was always there, it just wasn't revealed. And and the people under under the shadow were anticipating when the blood would be sprinkled. Now we are post, we are post-sacrificing, looking back at the, the, the sacrifice once for all. And so it's just a matter of perspective. It's literally just a matter of perspective. And anyone who's trying to say these are two different things, anyone who's trying to say this is, it, it's, it's just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. Anyone else? I'm Thank sorry. Sure, Tim. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 I, I was just thinking of what has been discussed. And I thought of a man hanging on a cliff and he saw a shadow you know, of a person coming towards him. And so the owner of the shadow, he knows that there is someone coming, but just because he saw a shadow, he cannot be lifted out of the cliff until the owner of the shadow yeah. will come and, and be the one to give him out of the cliff. So you cannot separate the shadow from the true copy, but nice. it's the true, yes. the true one who can really bring you out of, uh, of the cliff. Yeah. No, <clears throat> excellent. That's even better. I, can I use that? I'm going to use that in the future. That's even a better analogy. Can I use that? I'm going to use that. Sonny, go ahead. Do you want to add? Uh, yes. Um, regarding regarding the issues of old old covenant and uh, old covenant in relation to Old Testament, uh, there are some who uh, argue that the Old Testament is not the Old Covenant, and there are also argue that the Old Testament is actually the Old Covenant. So, um, for example, David Lambeau, uh, I think he's um, he's not uh, really that uh, you know famous, but uh, he believed that that uh, that that the Old Testament is the record of the Old Covenant. One of his reasons is that uh, because there are there are narrative account or historical account of the of the old testament and that also brings out the uh that also contains the uh, old covenant let's say for example in exodus chapter uh, in exodus uh it, it has a narrative from egypt to you know uh, drawing out from egypt but in, in chapter 20 chapter 20 and so on that there is a record of the covenant so how can we what is your view on that um uh, you know in, in my take I haven't think more about it, but uh, this is really a little bit to, uh, you know, give confusions to some, maybe some of us here uh, that uh, uh, some kind of, uh, I would say, uh, you know, confusions between the relationship of the new covenant or and, and the, I mean, the, the old covenant and the old testament. Yeah. So are they equal or the same? Yeah. 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 So, so uh, yes and no. So the, the 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 um the, the first thing that we want to say is that the, the idea of using the word testament and ball springs you know what can i'm going to hold your question for our powerpoint what time is it right now let's table your question sonny let's come back to it i want to work through the powerpoint i think we can do it um and i'll work through it i'll put the video on youtube so you can watch it again if i kind of rush through it a little bit it might be stressful um i can ask your questions on sunday night i do want to get through chapter two notes because we're just never going to make it. We, we will never make it through this chat through this this semester. So let's let's work through the PowerPoint, um, and then we can we can ask your questions if we have time tonight, and also Sunday night. So um, let's go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this and I'm gonna bring up the uh, the PowerPoint. So um, and we'll get to your, we'll get to your questions, Sunday. I promise. So I, I hope that we answered these questions for you. The primary topic is the high priesthood. The, the comparison is Old and New Covenants. Um, the comparison is between the two. One is better than the other. Um, the broader theme and subject is going to be this idea of covenant. Old and New Covenant, the comparison is, is greater and better. Shadow and types, okay? And then, of course, how is this revelation present in the, in the context? The covenants are revelation, okay? So we need to understand all the covenants are God's special revelation to us. 
A covenant is agreement between two with stipulations, promises, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? We'll get more into that throughout the semester, okay? Um, okay, and then how does this inform our understanding of Revelation? It's climax. The climax is in the mediator of the new covenant, okay? So there's a climax in Christ, okay? All right, synthesis. Let's, let's talk through the synthesis really quick. The big, so these are big ideas that I want all of us to get. Number one, for our framework, number one, the relationship between the Old and the New Testament is one of promise and fulfillment. So that's, I think I beat, I beat that dead horse. You know, you saw it all over. Um, I, I think that's, that's strong and we should really focus on that. Number two, the two big constructs of Revelation are Old and New Covenant. So Sonny's question is the difference between Covenant, Old Covenant and Old Testament. And um, I really hate the word Testament. It was a bad translation. They should have never translated Old Testament, New Testament. They should have translated it Old Covenant, New Covenant. So our Testament should have not been called Testament. That they, The translators focused on the Greek, and you can't because the origin of, 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 of the word covenant comes from berith, the Hebrew word berith. So it was a, it, that was a mistake, okay? So I'll just say that right out up front, and that's what's caused so much confusion, okay? Um, so that's why I'm saying here the two big constructs of Revelation are old and new covenants, okay? The, the dichotomy between covenant and testament, testament was not in the mind of the first century at all. It, it's just, that's, that's why we need to know Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> you, can never, you can imagine, that's why we need to know. Um, old and new covenants are special revelation. Old covenants are, old and new covenants are special re revelation, okay? Number three. The old covenant is a pattern type shadow of the greater reality. That's a big construct for biblical theology. And it helps us when we read through the Old Testament. We're anticipating that maybe this is a type. Maybe this is pointing to something bigger, okay? Um, next, the new covenant is mediated by Christ, permanent, eternal, in which the church is his body, okay? And so maybe this is hard for us to think about, but you cannot separate the church, the body of Christ from Christ the head. It's just impossible. And so people will want to talk about, well, the church is its own entity. You can't. Are we, re are we receiving mediation from Jesus? Yes. Are we receiving the sacrifice from Jesus? Yes. Are we receiving his intercession from Jesus? Yes. Uh, are we his body? Yes. Do we have his spirit? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we are part of the new covenant okay so you know uh, we celebrate the new covenant every month if you partake in lord's supper you are separating you are celebrating the blood of the covenant and you're proclaiming the gospel and you're proclaiming the gospel okay christ's message god's final revelation and we're spoken focusing on uh self-disclosure god's Final revelation, self-disclosure. God's self-disclosure is climaxed in Christ, and it's directly connected. It's intertwined with redemption. I, I, I hope you saw that. You cannot separate the two, okay? You cannot separate the two. Um, uh, synthesis. Uh, some would say, like, it looks so different. It looks so different. And so this is um, um, this is the picture that we're going to show in a minute. Um but this is the seed flower that the seed looks different than the flower, but the genetic information is the same, okay? The relationship is fulfillment and degree, not antithesis, not aside, not abrogation, okay? It's fulfillment and degree, okay? Now, within the big frameworks, dispensationalism, new covenant and, and covenant, all three have kind of adjusted. So in some sense, they're trying to do this justice. The more extreme dispensationalists are more antithesis or aside. And, and I just really, I, I, from EVST's perspective, that's just not, you know, they mean well, but it, it's, 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 I think it's a really hard read of scripture. I'm, I'm trying to be generous. It's, it's a hard read, okay? Um, progressive dispensationalism really fits. They're dealing with fulfillment and degree. New covenant is dealing with fulfillment and degree. Covenant is dealing with, 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 with fulfillment and degree. So um, what I'm trying to say is that looking at all of this, it, it doesn't really, it's not a linchpin. 
like, oh, you got to be one or the other. I want to be very fair. There are very good scholars on all three spectrums. Okay, so I want to be fair. Okay, but again, this is not a this is not a uh, uh, a frameworks class, so we're not going to go into those details. Okay, so I just want to I, I, I want to be fair and, and honest with the, the evidence and the conclusions we're making. Okay, I want to be fair, I want to be fair with that. Okay, um, uh, but of course you know my you know where I, my perspective. Okay, so this is why. <laughs> <laughs> the big picture, biblical theology is the blossoming of God's revelation from Adam to Christ. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna tweak out why it's Adam to Christ, but I but I hope you can see that. So on the right, you have you have the seed and you have the flower. Okay, so this is this is the picture. Okay, chapter two. Uh, we will discuss the reading after if we want, or we can save that for Sunday. Okay. Um, uh, Overview of the field of Revelation. So chapter two, chapter two. Okay, I'm just going to read through this, and I'll make some highlights where I where I can, and then at the end, if you have a question, write down your question. We can ask. Okay, um, mapping out the field of Revelation. So 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 um, uh, uh, Voss is going to map out the field the field of Revelation, and so he has an introduction, and so he says um, general Revelation is also called natural Revelation. So we we want to we want to make that clarification so that we're, we're really tracking with, with terms. Uh, special revelation is called supernatural revelation. It is related to and within the sphere of specific, specific self-disclosure of God. So I want to be very clear here, okay? Um, there's been questions about the Word of God, about special revelation. We're defining special revelation in this context, this parameter, okay? So I think all of us should say there's, with this definition, there is no more new revelation. Otherwise, you're saying that Christ's self-disclosure and explanation in his apostles, which is the New Testament, which is the scripture, is deficient, okay? So with this, these definitions, I'm going to be firm. There is no new special revelation. God has definitively and climactically revealed himself to us, past tense, in his son and 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 his son's apostles through <coughs> um, supernatural means led by the spirit have explained him for us okay so there's and that, I'm, I'm i'm summarizing in big categories old and new testament the scripture and that's that's done there's no new scripture there's no new special revelation in this sense okay i am i am as a teacher i'm going to kind of draw the line there um that doesn't close the door for a Wayne Gruden position on, on the gifts and, and prophecy or, or, or a very moderate um, Pentecostal position. Okay, so I want to be clear here. Okay, so, so, so I'm not closing the door in that area. We can have those debates. Okay, but it is closing the debate. Anyone who's saying there's special revelation in this sense would be heretical. Okay, I, I want to be very clear on that. Um, and I don't want to be mistaken. Um, Wayne Grudem and other, I think Sam Storm's position as well would. St they're Pentecostal. They're 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 conservative. They're reformed. They're good. Um, you can still have something like that. Now, now, you know, I want to push back. I want to disagree with them in those areas. But I love Wayne Grudem. Sam Storm's is really good on eschatology. So, so you know, I, I want to be again fair and, and and add that caveat here. Okay. Um, next, there are two different uh, epochs concerning. Uh, of this relationship. Uh, so you looked at the epoch, the era before sin, and then there's an era after sin. So looking at special revelation, there's two fundamental eras, special revelation before and after sin. And this would be coming from Voss, Biblical Theology, page 28. Next, we have the, the framework pre-fall. We have the framework pre-fall. God reveals himself. So this is Voss speaking. God reveals himself um, uh, to the inner sense of man through the religious consciousness and moral consciousness. Religious consciousness is through um, um, uh, relationship with God. That's what Voss means. He, he, he explains it somewhere. I might have had it somewhere. But that's what he means. He's not talking of religious in a negative sense or in a purely human sense, or in a, um, 
a, a very negative, it's, it's in a very positive sense in which we, there's direct communion with God. That's how he, that's how he defines religious consciousness. So we're not thinking of it in, in these other, these other ways. Okay. Um, he also reveals himself in the works of nature without. It is obvious, obvious that the latter, that is moral conscious, must rest on the former. Moral consciousness must rest upon religious con uh, consciousness. If there were no antecedent innate knowledge of God, no amount of nature of observation would lead to an adequate conception of God. So we need to have an innate knowledge of God prior to looking at natural revelation, okay? And that is the case when we are made in the image of God. That is the case in, in Romans uh, 1, 19 and following, that we have this innate, um, at Romans 1 and, and chapter 2, we have this innate uh, knowledge of God in our, in our heart, in our conscience, okay? Um, the presupposition of all knowledge of God is man's having been created in the image of God. On the other hand, knowledge from inner nature is not complete in itself apart from the filling out receives through discovery of God in nature. So the two have to interact, okay? Um, and this is pre-fall. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay. Um, uh, in this era, there was the most direct spiritual fellowship. The stream of revelation flowed uninterrupted uninterruptedly and there was no need for storing up waters in any reservoir from where to draw sub subsequently okay so what Voss is saying is in pre-fall revelation because of the setup there is a difference between natural revelation special revelation but because of God's creation of image of God and knowledge of God there was free whether he's speaking whether man is looking at nature or he's speaking to God there is a free, it's, it's, it's just all fellowship. It's all roses. It's just beautiful, okay? Um, Pre-fall, pre-sin, okay? That is the structure. And I hope that your homework assignment in chapter three really bore that out. I hope it bore it out. Henry had made a comment about, about natural revelation, and I kind of, oh, I was kind of like pushing, I was kind of deflecting, but um, uh, yeah, so we can talk about that when we're done here, okay? Um, uh, that's B Voss, Biblical Theology, page 28 to, to, to 30, okay? We're, we're almost there. We're almost there. Um, post-fall. So post-fall. Post-fall, supernaturalism in Revelation, through its need, was greatly and accentuated by sin. It did not first originate from that. But sin entering in the structure of natural revelation itself is disturbed and put in need of correction. Nature from within no longer functions normally in sinful man. Both his religious or his communication with God, relationship with God, his religious and moral sense of God may have been uh, become blunted and blinded. And that's Voss, page number 29. Tim, just, just for clarification, because when we talk about general revelation and special revelation, uh, the understanding would be God's creation and God's word. Yes, yes. Uh, but here, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Voss is saying that the general revelation, of course, that's through nature. But the special revelation is God's revelations to man, um, self-disclosure to man within and without I mean, he termed the special revelation when he reveals himself to man particularly, and it is within and without. Yeah, yeah. That's so really he, he uses the word special revelation different from systematic theologians. Yeah. Which simply term uh, general revelation to creation and special revelation as to the word of God. Yeah, I have a little bit confusion about the, you know, the duality that uh, uh, Voss is presenting because uh, basically in systematic theology, we know that the general revelations is twofold. Number one, there is a revelations by nature, uh, by, by outside also, like, uh, you know, creation, 
and also there is what we call the uh, general revelations that is within, like uh, the conscience of, of of man, man's uh, you know uh, created in the image of God. So uh, that's that's how systematic theology. Uh, uh, I think I think that's that's. Okay, so uh, let's just be let's just be clear here, okay? I don't think I. So let's not misread him because so I'm pulling direct quotations here, okay? So. He defines general revelation with natural natural revelation and special revelation with supernatural. So he's in agreement with 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 um, uh, with standard nomenclature within systematic theology. So I don't I don't think we should misread. Maybe maybe it's a difficult read, but the, but my interpretation. I can go back and double check. Let me go back and double check. My understanding is that what he's saying here in pre-fall is that is that. Um, Functionally, functionally, there is no difference. Although, the, although he defined, there is a difference. So, for example, God blessing and giving man dominion over his creation, that's special revelation. Natural revelation is him creating um, creation and man looking at creation and then understanding God did this. It was the work of God. It was the word of God. Man would just look at that creation and say, oh, God did this. He didn't have to be told that God did it. He didn't have to be like, oh, that came from the word of God's mouth. He didn't have to be explained that. He could, he automatically freely saw the natural revelation and, and saw God. Okay, so so functionally, whether God said, I created that through the word of my mouth, or man looking at the creation, it's functionally the same. He comes to the same conclusion. Okay. I think that's what he's trying to emphasize. That there functionally there is no difference, but he does clarify at the he sets out by clarifying it. So, so I don't think it's a, it's, it's a full one to one, but it could be his confusion. Maybe reread that if that makes sense. That's how I read it. Um, and if it if it's still if, if you still think there's a question, let's discuss it on Sunday night. Okay. Um, great great comment, great question. Ending is that making sense or, or or is that yeah okay yeah so um, uh, yeah. revelation has been affected through the fall, both religious communication and also moral. Um, he, he can't see natural revelation. When he looks at natural revelation, he doesn't see God. He doesn't see the work of God's hands. He doesn't see that um, that this is in fact uh, God God and God's word and God's plan, okay? So it's been, it's been um, there's been a barrier placed there, okay? Um, moving on here, some more comments here. He says, under the rule of redemption, an external body is created to which the divine intercourse with man attaches itself. So this is like, wow, this is really hard to read. But what he's just saying is that because of man's corruption, there is now, and there is now, there has to be a mediator. There has to be mediation. That's what he's trying to say, an external embodiment. Okay, is everyone tracking? So, so whether it's an angel, whether it's, God becoming man, whether it's a, a vision, uh, there's there's some type of it's not there is no direct intercourse between God and man. Okay, there is this mediation. So maybe we want to say mediation there. Um, the objective products of redemption in facts institutions are are a reminder of this changed manner of divine approach. We no longer have direct communication. So all the religious things that we do that God's they just remind us of this separation. The same change is observable in the perpetuation of the divine manifestations received in the past. So all, all of the way he reveals, all of the things he calls us to do in the old covenant, the new covenant, these are reminders to us that we've fallen. <laughs> and now there has to be some, some change there. Um, more importantly, nature cannot unlock the door of redemption. So the, the, the big takeaway is that nature cannot reveal to, no longer can reveal to us redemption. And number three is sin has fundamentally changed the mood of man by which he receives a supernatural approach to God. Is that making sense? I'm rushing a little bit. I, I apologize. I, you can watch this again. Is this making sense? Yeah, okay. Number number four, uh, comparison. So he's going to make a comparison here. 
in this state of rectitude, this was not a mode of fear, but trustful friendship. So pre-fall, that, that, revel, that intercourse, that, re, that revelation, that communication, there, it was just trust. There was communion. There was fellowship. There was no fear. In the state of sin, the approach of the supernatural causes dread. Something well to be distinguished from the proper reverence with which man at all times ought to meet God and which is inseparable from the act of religion as such. And so the clearest example of this is Exodus 19. Henry, we did this in the Bible's big story. When God comes to meet Israel on the mountaintop, he comes in the cloud, in the thunder, in the lightning, in the fire. This is his people. He just saved them. He just redeemed them. And they are terrified of his voice. They said, do not let God speak to, to us. You speak to us. <laughs> uh, this is the reality. When we see the, the real revelation of God, apart from a mediation, apart from Christ, we have terrifying dread and fear. That's uh, Voss Biblical Theology. So this is, this is the state of revelation post-fall, okay? All right, so now we have the division of redemption. So the, 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 that's kind of the situation of redemption. Those are things we're going to be looking at as we study. So now we have the division of redemption. Um, uh, this is getting to Sonny's question. Redemption, redemptive special revelation is called the covenant of grace. Actually, this is also getting to Cyrus's question. Um, redemptive special revelation is also called the covenant of grace. So think about post-fall, post-fall, where you have the judgment and the promise up until, up until the climax of Christ, we call this the covenant of grace. Now, maybe you don't hold to the covenant theology. Just You can just call it redemptive special revelation, <laughs> okay? But that's what boss means. That's what the, essentially the covenant of grace um, concerning revelation is, okay? It's, it's redemptive special revelation, all right? Um. Special a special revelation pre-redemptive is called the covenant of works. So the covenant of works preceding the fall is called special revelation pre-redemptive. Special revelation pre-redemptive. Okay. Redemption begins with the promised offspring to undo the curse, the proto-evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel of um, to undo the sin of curse and death and to destroy the serpent and his works. So that's when redemption begins. So this really gets to Cyrus's question of, of you know, what about the Mosaic law? How do they, how are they saved? No, everyone's saved. Everyone is redeemed eternally. If they're trusting in the promise to undo the, to, to, the promise of the offspring to undo the, 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 the curse of sin and death and destroy the serpent and his works. Um, redemptive special revelation is given two eras, Old Covenant, New Covenant. That's Voss, page 32. We've got two more slides and we're done. Okay, two more slides and we're done. Bereith, that's Hebrew for covenant, is the foundation and the primary meaning for what the Old Covenant and New Covenant mean, both in explanation and substance. The Bible never implies the sense of testament to Bereith, okay? So this idea of testament comes through the Greek word diatheke, and it's, it was a mistake. Um, it was a mistake. Uh, uh, um, now, <coughs> not in the sense of the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, because the New Testament the New Testament is following the Septuagint. We do not believe that the Septuagint is inspired, okay? All right? So the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture, okay? But for us, the biblical understanding of, this is why Greek and Hebrew are so critical, uh, we have to understand covenant in the, co in the Hebrew context. That's where, it, that's the source. That's, that's, that's where it was first used. A, a, a purely one-sided prominence or ordinance or law becomes bereath, not by reason of its inherent conceptual or etymological meaning, 
but by the reason of the sanction added. So what Voss is even getting to is that it's not even the word. It's not even word usage itself. It's not even a, a linguistic argument. It's, it's not connected with linguistics. It's not connected with word etymology, but the religious sanction. <laughs> so it's, it's coming from God. Okay, so what's so significant, what makes it unchangeable, what makes it, what makes it eternal, or temporary, however, however it, it wor works itself out, it's based on the religious significant, the religious sanction that God puts with it. Again, special revelation, okay? That's why diatheke is not, in one sense, deficient, in another sense, it is deficient. Because it doesn't matter what diatheke, the range of meaning is, it's connected with barith, and it's connected with the, the accompanying... <laughs> Religious sanction, it's accompanied with, with, with the act and command of God. Okay, everyone tracking with me there? I hope everyone's seeing this. The barith is an outstanding characteristic, which is unalterableness, certainty, eternal validity, and not voluntary or changeable in nature. The barith as such is a faithful barith, something not subject to abrogation. Okay. Now, this is where, this is where he, he addresses the Greek, but from my perspective, we can just close the book, okay? What the Greek word means is, 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 is not of great significance um, because it's just the translation of the Hebrew. Is everyone tracking there with me? It's the translation of the Hebrew. So um, every language has deficiency going from one language to another, okay? So... He's going to explain why the, the Greek word diatheke is used, but it's inconsequential because our foundation is on berith, the Hebrew. And really, it's not even based on the Hebrew. It's based on God's work accompanying with it. Okay, so it's supernatural. Supernatural, okay? Voss, page 32 to, 30, to 33, okay? Now, what Voss does do is he, do, he defends the use of diatheke, and so we can agree with that. You know, so I agree with that. Okay, so we can defend the usage of diatheke, but again, the foundation is not in the Greek, not in the Septuagint, okay? The, the, the reasons for choosing, he gives three. Um, the, the one reason is the only other Greek option was synthike, and it was even worse. That, that was the worst option. So the, the Greek translators used diatheke. They're not inspired, although God worked through them. Um, but not supernaturally, okay? The, because the, the Septuagint is, does not agree with the, the Greek in all instances, I, with the Hebrew. And so the Hebrew is God's perfect, inerrant, inspired word. The, the Septuagint is a good translation, but it's not perfect, okay? So the, 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 the Septuagint writers use diatheke, the best option they had. Um, a reason for using diatheke is the supremacy and monergism of God that is emphasized in that. And so that's connected with question number three, not so much last will, but more focused upon this disposition for oneself, self-disclosure or, or, or something related to the self um, in, in, this, uh, in this generic usage. Um, now, historically, this was necessary. All modern lexicons, when you look up diatheke, they actually say, no, it just means covenant. And so actually... You know, from my perspective, the range of meaning for diatheke, it just, it should also, the range of meaning should not be disposition for oneself. I, I do think that maybe Voss did not have all the resources. You know, maybe, maybe there's some misunderstandings there. I just translate it as covenant and, and there's extra biblical examples of where it's just covenant. And there's biblical, many biblical examples where it's just covenant, most notably in the Old and New Testament. So, um, any questions or comments? I went through that fast. I hope it makes sense. Any questions? Uh, uh, I just, I just, um, you know, conf uh, not, not confused. I'm just wonder if the Hellenistic Jewish that during that time who does not even know Hebrew, but you know, they, these these are the Hebrews who are really spreading throughout the ancient Myron and speak Greek, and also have this Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. I was wondering if there is a conflict between Hebraist Jewish and also the Hellenistic Jewish when they came together. And, and also uh, I was thinking of Apostle Paul, how did Paul, Paul really conceptualize the, the term diatheke when he wrote 
in Greek in in, in the New Testament. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking of 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 you know uh, the 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 borrowed yes the borrowed the the Cohen Greek. They are thinking at the same times they built in the the you know Hebrew heritage or Hebrew yeah. patriarchs you know range of meaning at that point uh, when they wrote. So, so, like so the clearest example is when Paul refers to the, when he used diatheke, he'll refer to the old covenant, diatheke. So yes. we would never, we would not translate it Old Testament. And in his mind, he's not translating Old Testament. He's, he's just literally, old, it would be Old Covenant. So I would say that the, the diatheke conveyed covenant, whether it was Helen, the, 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 the Hellenist Jews or the, or the, um, the true Jews, you know, you know, the, the, the okay. Aramaic okay. Jews or whatever, they would have this concept. It would just be a part of it because you're just substituting old covenant. You know, that's just the way. That's just the way it would be. Yeah. Tim, Tim, did you consider uh, both uh, one reason that it could be what he called translation compromise, the use of the ateki? Yeah. Yeah. So. So. So he he specifies that and um, with the Septuagint writers, and and that could be. But again, you know, Voss is more limited in Greek. So the way we de so just very short linguistic conversation. The way we determine range of meaning, especially in languages that aren't spoken anymore, is you all you do all you can do is you just look at you look at all the written resources. And you look at how the word is used in context and all the different resources. Voss and even the 18th, 17th, 16th century, they had much more limited Greek resources than we do today. And so all the, whether it's a liberal lexicons or conservative lexicons, within the range of meaning, they just include covenant. They don't even have this. So like when I first read this, I was like, why is Voss like making this big deal? Like I look at my, I look at my B guy here. Um, I have I have here this is um this is BDAG. This is like this is from the University of Chicago. Number one, number one resource in the world for Greek. And one of the usages is just covenant. There's no, it's like that's part of the range of meaning. So, you know, um, and, and these guys are studying a lot of extra biblical texts. And that was probably something that that was a weakness because we, we're just we're, we're finding more we're studying more um maybe Voss only limited so so there's a lot of very variations but when 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 our new lexicons they're looking at more data and when they see like oh diatheke is being used in a covenant context okay we need to include within the range of meaning it, it could be last will it could be disposition for oneself it could be covenant okay so what we've done is we've just added the range of meaning to mean covenant. And I think that that's the case. I, I think that's the case. So I just, I think the deficient, I think we're just, that's beyond our ability. To, it's, it's beyond Voss's ability to make that determination, I think. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on here. We, oh my goodness, it's 930. Okay, I'm gonna finish really quick here. Okay, I, I apologize for going late. I'm going 15 minutes late. Um, it, my my conclusion is that it was a mistake to translate diatheke as as testament. Our translators in modern time, okay, that was a mistake, um, and that mistake could have been like that's all the knowledge they had at the time, um, but it should have been it should have been translated covenant, okay. Um, there is no difference between Barith and diatheke because they use diatheke to translate old and new covenants. One is such example as Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. And that's what Voss gives as, as an example. The meaning is held from, be, from Hebrew, not from a translation uh, in, into the Septuagint. Um, and then the New Testament writers use the Septuagint as a basis for their writings. And so that's why, again, it's coming back to the, to the buried um, meaning, okay? Last, this is the, the last statement here. The whole distinction between two dispensations, two arrangements, of which one is far superior to the other. So the whole big takeaway here is that we should not be using, we use New Old and New Testament because that's our Christianese now, okay? But we need to be very clear with our members 
that when we see Old and New Testament, it really should be Old and New Covenant. And we should just be aware that our Bibles, they use Old and New Testaments because that's the nomenclature. That's the Christianese, right? Um, but uh, the sense should not be this idea of testament, but of covenant, okay? Any questions or comments? We're late. Um, this is what I'm going to do, okay? I'm going to close in prayer, and then everyone who wants to leave can leave. If you have some questions, we can stay for maybe 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> there's no new homework next week, okay? We're, your assignments were due. Yeah, Sonny's laughing. Sonny, you got to catch up on your homework, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a, an opportunity for our lecture to catch up with the assignments. So there's no new homework this week. Um, those who have not are, are behind, do your old assignments. Um, we will begin afresh chapter three, Genesis one and two next week, okay? So I'm gonna close in prayer. And then if you wanna stay and ask a couple questions, we can stay for maybe 10 minutes because I do have to help my wife um, with the baby. Um, she gives me this time <laughs> that I have to help. So let's let's close in prayer. And then, and then um, uh, if you have a question, we can stay, but just for at the most 10 minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your love. We pray for your guidance. We thank you for tonight. I know it's deep. I know that some students, it's, it's probably so uh, stressful for them. Father God, I just pray that your spirit would fill them with your love, fill them with your your uh your grace may they recognize that this is just this is a new this is a new field this is a new path this is a new restaurant that they can go and enjoy and 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 uh, this is a new mall where they can explore uh father god i pray that we would not be stressed uh, th th this is a, a eye opener for many for many students uh, i just ask that your spirit would guide us guide us in all truth and father god um we want to exalt the name of your son. You have spoken definitively and to us through your son. And so help us to remember this truth. And we're so thankful that you are already fulfilling the promises that you've given to us. And, and we are just waiting um, uh, for the return of your son and the, the, uh, the final consummation of all things, Father. We ask that your spirit would guide us this week, strengthen us, and help us to um, do your will. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.